Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with Jesus. When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. In this first word from the cross, Jesus addresses God in prayer as Father, just as he does repeatedly in John's Gospel. This is not the corporate Our Father of the Lord's Prayer taught to his disciples and to us. This is the intimate My Father of a unique father-son relationship. In this short prayer, we have an intimate window on the inner life of the Trinity. For it was not only Jesus the man who was murdered on the cross, it was Jesus the God who was crucified. The prayer is an intercession, pleading for God's mercy on them. But who does he mean as them? Who are these people who need God's mercy? The Jewish authorities who demanded his death for blasphemy? The people of Jerusalem who colluded with them? The Romans who carried out the death sentence? Maybe all of these. I suggest many, many more than these. If Jesus is God, which Jesus claimed when he said, I and the Father are one, then his crucifixion was not the same as a martyr dying for a cause. It has universal and unique significance for the cruel, unjust, violent world we live in and for all the people in it, past, present, and future. I suggest then that in this prayer, Jesus is interceding for all people, those of his own time and those of our time, for you and for me. Such a universal intercession casts Jesus in the role of God's high priest. As we read in the epistle to the Hebrews, quote, he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Jesus on the cross as God's high priest, asks God to forgive all of us. In doing so, he anticipates us asking for forgiveness as we say the Lord's Prayer publicly and privately in worship and devotion. For forgiveness is central to good relationships removing barriers and alienation. It brings reconciliation, pardon, 
and peace. To know God's forgiveness is one dimension of salvation. We each need forgiveness of our sins, our bad thoughts, our harmful words, our harmful behavior, our forgetting or failing to do good, our selfish preoccupations. We're so used to pretending to ourselves that we are the good guys, in contrast to the bad guys out there somewhere, nothing to do with us. They might be criminals or politicians or corporations, etc. But they, they are the bad guys who we identify as responsible for the injustice, the cruelty, and the violence of our world. But we forget that by colluding with that world, as we do, in little ways and in big ways, we are actually the bad guys too, in need of God's mercy and forgiveness. In his prayer from the cross, Jesus also provides an excuse, a mitigation plea. He says, they know not what they do. This casts Jesus in the role of an advocate in court before God as judge. Of course, in our law courts, any such plea of ignorance of the law would not normally be accepted. So what is the ignorance Jesus refers to? I suggest it relates to both knowledge and faith. Speaking about future persecution of his disciples, Jesus told them, quote, But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. Jesus is saying that if people really knew God as God is in himself and understood the intimate relationship between God and Jesus and understood God's project in sending Jesus to this unjust, cruel, violent world, then they would behave very differently than they do and would no longer collude with the world system in opposition to God. I return to Jesus as high priest, for a priest not only intercedes on behalf of others, but also offers sacrifice to God at the altar on behalf of others. But here, here the priest is the sacrificial victim and the altar is the cross. And this is a once for all final sacrifice of universal power for all time. The crucifixion is also the expected culmination of God's Jesus project a culmination which was predicted many times by Jesus to his disciples, as the Gospels tell us. On the one hand, the crucifixion was an inevitable result of the challenge which Jesus posed to our violent world. On the other hand, the crucifixion sacrifice was necessary to God's plan to save us. The suffering of Jesus on the cross was all too real. 
Yet although the Jews and Romans thought they were in control, God was in control. It was God's plan. It was God's own sacrifice of himself. Salvation comes at a cost, and God paid the price. Jesus, as the sacrificial victim, recalls the Exodus story, the escape of Israel from Egypt, from slavery to freedom, from a living death to a new life. Key to that escape was the blood of the sacrificial lamb in each Israelite household, which was used to smear the doorposts of that house so that the angel of death would pass over and not enter there. In our conscious or unconscious collusion with an unjust, cruel, and violent human world, we too need to escape for, from our own kinds of slavery to freedom in God's kingdom, from our own kinds of living death to new life in Christ. The sacrifice of Jesus on the cross offers each one of us that escape, which is yet another dimension of salvation. Two things are required of us. First, that we should repent of our personal sins and of our collusion with the world system which opposes God. Second, that we should have faith in Jesus as God incarnate and crucified God, and so believe that his sacrifice has the power to save us. And the people stood by, watching. But the leaders scoffed at Jesus, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the King of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the King of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let's consider the lead up to the second word of Jesus from the cross. He is mocked in different ways by two distinct groups of people. The rulers, that is, the Jewish religious leaders mock him for the religious claim that he is the Christ, the anointed one, the long expected Messiah. The soldiers, who would be Romans from elsewhere in the empire, mock Jesus for the political claim that he is the king of the Jews. 
Each group has its own agenda because Jesus posed a different threat to them. A religious threat to the Jews, a political threat to the Romans. These were exactly the same two threats which operated at each stage of the trial of Jesus, which led to his death sentence and to the cross. For the Jewish authorities, it was his blasphemy set against his growing popularity among the people. For Pontius Pilate and the officers of the Roman occupation, it was the prospect of political instability and the danger of a Jewish revolt triggered by Jesus. Our focus now is on the two criminals who were crucified alongside Jesus. In Greek, they are described as kakurgoi, which literally means doers of bad things. We do not know what bad things, but to merit crucifixion, they were probably bandits or murderers or freedom-fighting terrorists. They represented the dregs of society, the scum of the earth. Yet here they were, dying alongside Jesus, God incarnate, creator and king of the universe. Throughout his earthly life, Jesus lived among poor and very ordinary people. Born in a stable in Bethlehem, brought up in Nazareth, an insignificant backwater town of no good reputation, friend of despised prostitutes and hated tax collectors, and now, now dying alongside the very worst people in society. But there is a remarkable contrast in the reactions of these two criminals to Jesus, based, I suggest, on what they heard the two groups of mockers say in their taunts. The Jewish religious rulers called on Jesus to save himself because he claimed to be Christ. So it's not surprising that one of the criminals simply copied exactly the same line, like a mantra, when he mocked Jesus. After all, it's so easy to follow the crowd unthinkingly, to conform to the majority view, the popular view, or the view of the leaders, whether they be religious or political leaders. As we know, individuals lose themselves in the crowd, and the crowd develops its own corporate mentality, often expressing itself in powerfully emotive slogans. It's easy to understand why one of the criminals chose to mock Jesus in just the way he did. During his trial before Pontius Pilate, which, which was probably in public, Jesus said this, quote, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If it did, my followers would be fighting to save me from the clutches of the Jews. My kingdom belongs elsewhere. From this statement, it's not surprising that the Roman soldiers called on Jesus to save himself 
because he claimed to be a king. When the other crucified criminal heard this, he chose not to copy the mockery, but to believe that Jesus really was a king beyond this world. That criminal must have realized that Jesus would not save himself, that he would go on to die just like him. But he must also have believed that Jesus would survive death and elsewhere in the afterlife he would indeed be a king and establish his kingdom there. These are remarkable thoughts for someone like that criminal. They are thoughts of faith and of hope in Jesus. This second criminal also turns to the first criminal, pointing out that they are both guilty of their crimes and justly condemned under the law but are still awaiting God's judgment for the same crimes. In doing so, he acknowledges his own guilt before God, which is nothing short of repentance, the precondition of God's forgiveness and the doorway to faith and hope. Then the second criminal turns to Jesus and begs only one favor, that in the afterlife, Jesus should remember him. Remember him. That's all, just to be remembered. Convinced as he was that Jesus would survive, he did not ask to survive death himself, only that he should be remembered. This should not surprise us. Knowing that Jesus was totally innocent, he would believe that God would not judge him. And so he, Jesus, would survive death. As for himself, knowing, knowing that he was totally guilty, he believed that he would be judged and condemned to annihilation by God. So many people want to be remembered for what they have been or what they have done in their lives. They want others to know that their lives had mattered, that they had somehow made a difference not just transient froth on the ocean of humanity. But the repentant criminal cannot have wanted to be remembered for what he had been or done. All he wanted was to somehow exist in the memory of Jesus because of who, who he recognized Jesus to be the Holy One of God. This criminal saw glory beyond the crucifixion for Jesus, victory beyond seeming defeat, which the frightened and scattered disciples of Jesus themselves could not see. When Jesus responds to the repentant criminal, he assures him that he will escape God's judgment and will survive death to be where Jesus is. That place Jesus calls paradise, which in Jewish thought was believed to be a walled garden of delight, a kind of new garden of Eden where the souls of the patriarchs and all righteous people were believed to go after death. So Jesus was telling the repentant criminal that he would be included 
among the righteous people. This returns us to his request to be remembered, because in Psalm 112, we read this, quote, the righteous shall be held in everlasting remembrance. So, as he spoke the second word from the cross, Jesus was flanked by two dying criminals, one a believer, the other an unbeliever. One repentant, expressing faith and hope in Jesus, the other unrepentant, mouthing mockery at Jesus. It would be easy to, to dismiss the unrepentant criminal from our minds as unworthy of further consideration, just to be written off. But let's recall the parable of the prodigal son. The anxious waiting father has equal love for both his sons, the obedient righteous one and the wayward disobedient prodigal one. And he waits in love for the return of his prodigal son, whom he would never write off. The crucified God is also the waiting father, who would love both of these criminals and would wait in love for the mocking criminal to repent and come to him. The offer of salvation is for everyone. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. A literal interpretation of this third word of Jesus from the cross is as follows. Jesus cared deeply for his mother and wanted to make arrangements for her domestic future because he was anxious for her. The take-home message would then be, we must take care of our own mothers. An alternative message could be to encourage adoption. But I cannot believe that Good Friday was the very first Mother's Day. Why not? First, on the few recorded occasions when Jesus spoke to Mary, he addresses her as woman, hardly an intimate, loving word, more a sign of formality or even irritation. He uses the same word to address the woman caught in adultery and the Samaritan woman who was living in sin. Second, we read the following in Mark's Gospel, quote, His mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting about him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside, asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking round on those who sat about him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God 
is my brother and sister and mother. This was surely a rejection of Mary, his mother. It also confirms that Jesus did have brothers and probably sisters too. So if Mary needed care after the death of Jesus, surely one or other of her children could provide it. After all, Jesus did not live at his family home during the years of his wandering ministry. Who was caring for Mary then? Certainly, Mary cannot have been dependent on Jesus. My third reason for saying that Good Friday was not the very first Mother's Day relates to John's Gospel itself, where this incident is recorded. John is extremely selective about his choice of material in telling the story of Jesus. Everything he mentions is for a good theological purpose, and even simple things turn out to have a much deeper meaning. It seems that the traditional interpretation of this incident is inconsistent with what we know about the relationship between Jesus and Mary, his mother. So let's think again. Let's start with the disciple whom Jesus loved, who without doubt was John the Apostle. Throughout the ministry of Jesus, his inner circle consisted of only three disciples, Peter, James, and John. Of these, only John was present at the foot of the cross. Peter and James had abandoned Jesus in fear and in hiding. But John's love for Jesus clearly overcame any fear of arrest or persecution he might have had. After the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, Peter, James, and John each became the leaders of the newborn Christian community, the beginning, the beginning of the Church of Christ. As such, they could each represent the whole church by their presence, their words, their decisions, their prayers. That being so, John the Apostle was at the foot of the cross, not just as himself, but also as the sole representative of the soon-to-be-born Church of Christ. At the cross, John personified the new church. If that is so, when Jesus describes John to Mary as her son, he is telling her that the church, represented by John, is her son, which means that he is describing Mary as the mother of the church. So Mary, the mother of God at the Incarnation, is to become the mother of the church after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. And the arrangement is made by Jesus at the crucifixion. In this way, we can, con can consider that Mary became the founding member of the church, the first Christian. Indeed, immediately after the ascension of Jesus, we find Mary at a prayer meeting in Jerusalem with the remaining 11 disciples, according to the Book of Acts. Stemming from her essential role in our salvation as Mother of God, Mary has given the Church 
the words of the Magnificat for its daily worship. It is a hymn which encapsulates the gospel values of faith, hope, and love, while at the same time undermining the pillars of our secular world, pride, power, and wealth. It literally turns our world and its priorities upside down. The Magnificat also highlights the virtues of humility and obedience, of which Mary is the supreme example. It ends with a reference to Abraham, the patriarch of faith for Jews, Christians, and Muslims. With obedience like Mary, Abraham obeyed God when he left his father's house to go to a new land. With obedience like Mary, Abraham obeyed God even to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. If, like St. Paul, we can see Jesus as the new Adam and so Mary as the new Eve, then I think we can also see Mary as the new Abraham, mother of God, mother of the church, and first Christian. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In my own life, I have had four numinous experiences which remain beyond explanation and which have been central in my own spiritual formation. I want to tell you about one of these. I was on an overnight train from Vienna, Austria to Krakow, Poland. During the night, in the sleeper compartment, I had the most vivid nightmare that I was lying in total darkness in a pit, surrounded by many others, whom I could hear and feel moving and groaning. Above the pit, I could hear harsh voices speaking in German, then cruel laughter as foul-smelling tar was poured on me and on the others. It was the worst nightmare I've ever had, and I woke in panic. I looked at my watch. It was 5.30 a.m., and the train had stopped. I stepped out into the corridor to see where we were. I saw a huge barbed wire fence and a field shrouded in mist beyond it. A woman was also standing in the corridor staring at the field and crying. I recognized her as an Italian from my compartment and asked her where we were. She drew her hand across her neck in a slitting motion and told me it was a place of murder and death. I began making connections with my nightmare. When the train eventually arrived in Krakow, an announcement was made 
apologizing for the delay, first in Polish, which I did not understand, and then in German, which I did. We were informed that our train had been diverted from Katowice because of a derailment, and that the train had been held up for an hour in the village of Oswitzim, which of course is Auschwitz. Then I realized that I must have had my dream at Auschwitz, the worst of the Nazi death camps, notorious for terror and horror. Through that experience, I've come to understand why so many Jews have become secular and have lost their faith since the Holocaust. For them, God forsook and abandoned God's people. God was quite simply absent and either has no power to stop suffering or worse, chooses not to use the power. For many Jewish people, it was the ultimate experience of dereliction, of being totally lost and forgotten. Was this the experience of Jesus on the cross as he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? using the beginning words of Psalm 22. Of course, it was natural for Jesus the Jew to pray the Psalms, because the Psalms help form the religious life of all devout Jews. But surely this is truly, truly a cry of dereliction, given the circumstances and not just religious observance, saying a psalm. When Johann Sebastian Bach set music to the seven last words from the cross, he provided a kind of musical halo for each of the words, except this fourth word. Jesus is utterly alone, because although he himself knew no sin. He was made sin for us. Christ identified so completely with us that he experienced as our substitute the great distance between lost sinful people and God. As Simone Weil has said, quote, in order that we should realize the distance between ourselves and God, it was necessary that God should be a crucified slave. For we do not realize distance except in the downward direction. We are what is furthest from God. In our being, God is torn. We are the crucifixion of God. How could that which is good love that which is evil without suffering? And that which is evil suffers too in loving that which is good. The mutual love of God and human being is suffering. In speaking the fourth word from the cross, Jesus speaks on our behalf as sinners at a great distance from God. In dying that death on the cross, Jesus showed the self-emptying, kenotic character of God, which is not just the character of the crucified God, but the very character of God the Trinity. In St. John's Gospel, we hear these words of Jesus. 
And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. These words, of course, refer to the future crucifixion and to the story in the book of Numbers. Let's recall that story. The people wandering in the desert started complaining against God and Moses. God punished the people by sending snakes which attacked them. Then God provided a way by which the people could be healed. Moses was to make a bronze snake and put it on a pole so that anyone who saw the bronze snake would be healed of the poison of a bite from a real snake. Here is incredible imagery. The Lord of the serpents is also the God of healing. The snake, as agent of death, is also the agent of life. Healing actually involved looking at, facing, the enemy itself. As the prophet Hosea said, quote, Return to the Lord, for he has torn us, that he may heal us. He has stricken us, and he will bind us up. The interpretation is clear. The bronze snake is the antidote to the attacks of the real snakes. Jesus on the cross, lifted up on a pole, is the bronze snake for us, the antidote to the sin which is attacking us, blighting our lives and leading us to death. Jesus was made sin for us so that we might be healed of sin and its effects. Back to the Garden of Eden, the serpent was the agent by which sin destroyed the relationship between Adam and Eve and God, between humankind and God. Jesus, the new Adam, is also the bronze serpent who is our wounded healer. Sin is a big universal problem. The cross is a big universal solution to that problem. In the book of Deuteronomy, we read, quote, Accursed be everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus, our wounded healer, became a curse for our sakes, and as a cursed being, knew the separation, the distance from God that sin involves. This was the dereliction, the abandonment, the forsakenness that Jesus knew on the cross and yet in doing so revealed to us that God the Trinity is sacrificial, outpouring, giving, and self-emptying, and all for you and for me. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
the cry of being forsaken in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark is a quote by Jesus from Psalm 22 and shows us how intense his suffering on the cross was. By contrast, the three words of Jesus from the cross, which we find in John's Gospel, speak of Jesus in control of what's happening, achieving God's intended purpose, dying gloriously and victoriously. Psalm 22 clearly has a strong connection with the detail of the crucifixion of Jesus. Let's look at three sections of it. First, quote, I am a worm and no man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock at me, saying, He trusted his cause to God. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. You will recognize that this describes accurately the words of mockery actually directed at Jesus by the bystanders. Second, Quote, a company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them, and for my robe they cast lots. This again accurately describes how crucifixion is carried out and uncannily predicts how the Roman soldiers would dispose of Jesus' clothing, which is recorded in all four Gospels. This is evidence that the crucifixion was no accident. It was planned by God right from the beginning planned in love for our salvation. Third, quote, My strength is dried up like baked clay, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. Here is a description of thirst. So when Jesus said, I thirst, we have two ways to interpret his word. Either he is simply stating the obvious bodily condition of a dying man, or he is once again referring to Psalm 22, which he would know by heart. That is what John the Evangelist wants us to understand. Jesus is in control of his mission, already foretold in Psalm 22. In the same gospel, we hear Jesus say, quote, I lay down my life for my sheep. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This mission I have received from my Father. So the crucifixion was the deliberate self-sacrifice of Jesus the Good Shepherd. By saying, I thirst, Jesus shows us that he is fulfilling his purpose according to the plan of God in order to save us, the lost sheep. The thirst of Jesus also reminds us of the desert, the place of need, beyond civilization and settled existence, the place of desolation and temptation and exclusion. 
For the place of thirst is also the place of encounter with God. Perhaps you know the pre-Raphaelite painting by Holman Hunt called The Scapegoat. It depicts the Jewish ritual recorded in the book of Leviticus, in which on the annual day of atonement, the high priest would confess the sins of all the people over the scapegoat before driving it away, carrying all the community's sins off into the desert and to certain death. The scapegoat was the agent of atonement, at one month, by removing the sins of the people so that they would be reconciled with God once more for another year. In Leviticus we read, quote, the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities to a land uninhabited. And in John's Gospel, John the Baptist points to Jesus saying, quote, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus on the cross was our scapegoat sent off to the place of thirst and to death once and for all, bearing our sins with him. God thirsts for us, and we are made to thirst for God. In God's loving thirst for us, God was crucified on the cross, reconciling the world to himself. In our thirst for God, we seek the living water that only the crucified and risen Christ can supply. The thirst of Jesus on the cross is answered by yet more torture in his dying moments, a drink of vinegar, sour wine. Vinegar is failed wine, which in John's Gospel is code for the failure of the Jewish religion to bring God and his people together. Jesus himself is the new wine. The use of a Jewish purification stick to give vinegar to Jesus on the cross underscores the message John wants us to get. Jesus was given the vinegar soaked into a sponge. But Jesus himself is like a sponge, absorbing all the sin of the world throughout history, just like a sponge absorbing fluid, yet not contaminated by that fluid, remaining pure. In John's Gospel, the sixth word of Jesus from the cross is a cry. It is finished, which is expressed by a single Greek word, tetelestai. Its translation is fuller than just finished. It means the end or goal or purpose has been reached. So this is an end of mission statement by Jesus. This is a cry of victory. What does this mean? I think it means we should not see the crucifixion as defeat and the resurrection as victory. Instead, we should see the crucifixion as the gate of glory. I think it also means that all Christ's living was a dying, providing us with a pattern of life too. 
If the cross stands at the centre of history, and if it is central to our understanding of both the nature of God and the human dilemma, and to discovering more about the mystery of our existence, then we have to recognise the meaning of the cross for us as the way in which all of us are meant to live and die in daily life. The glorious victory of the cross was achieved against almost impossible odds. The assembled forces of evil and sin and the powers of darkness of this unjust, cruel, and violent world. We may here recall the unequal fight between David and Goliath and see Jesus as the new David. The glorious victory of the cross was achieved by self-sacrifice in obedience to God. We may here recall the obedience of both Abraham and Isaac in their willingness to go ahead with the sacrifice of Isaac and see Jesus as the new Isaac. The glorious victory of the cross means that the kingdom has begun in Christ. The cross has redeemed time itself and the powers of this world are forever ultimately subverted. And those who follow and worship Jesus are called to live in a new way, to carry on God's work in the world. John's Gospel provides the link between our commission as disciples and the completion of Christ's work on the cross, when Jesus says, quote, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Beyond the cross is the kingdom, and the life of the kingdom is a living and a dying to self, a life of growing in holiness and developing self-awareness, a life too of suffering and reconciling and bearing witness to Christ and for Christ. For Jesus, it was finished. For us, it isn't over. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. There is a danger for us Christians that the crucifixion of Jesus may lose its power in our lives because it becomes just too familiar. I suggest this can happen for two reasons. First, we may regard it simply as a past event in history, its central pivotal event, which was essential for our salvation. Of course, that's true up to a point, but if the cross is to exert its power in our lives now, it needs to become an experience into which we can enter now and throughout our lives so that it may support us in all that we face and may keep returning us back to God. In other words, the cross is to become the formative pattern of our lives as we grow in holiness, 
a companion story side by side with the story of each of our lives. The narrative of the cross can help us see our lives, our goals, our destiny, and our world in perspective. So as we gather for Eucharistic worship, we gather at the foot of the cross, and our liturgy is enacted under the shadow of the cross. Second, the cross may lose its power for us because when we read the Passion narrative in the Gospels, we get the impression of a neat drama with a neat ending. Details like the sun's light fading as Jesus says his final word from Psalm 31 and then slips gently from the scene simply adds to that impression. Such an impression denies the barbarism of crucifixion as a method of execution, so well portrayed in Mel Gibson's classic film. Such an impression denies the reality of the tremendous cosmic battle that has been fought and the tremendous victory that has been won and the truly staggering cost of forgiveness on a universal scale. The cost of forgiveness. I well remember a London vicar who gave up her ministry because she found it impossible to forgive the terrorist bombers who murdered her daughter. She lived daily with the question, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I also remember a bishop who eventually came to terms with the death of his son while he and his wife were missionaries in Africa, who could finally say, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. I also remember a theologian who was a bereaved father. He made an important connection for all who suffer when he said this, quote, the Christian life is lived in between. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So we turn now to the seventh word of Jesus from the cross. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This is prayer to God the Father, as only Jesus could pray it, in the intimacy of the dynamic relationships between the persons of the Trinity. Although it sounds like it, this is not a prayer of res resignation, a prayer of giving up. It is a prayer of readiness to continue with the work of salvation. As Jesus prepared to enter hell itself in the dark night of death, and so the terrible silence and absence that is Holy Saturday begins. For if Jesus is our way of access to God the Father, then there can be no access on Holy Saturday when Jesus is dead to the world. This is not a quiet going to the Father. This is entering the very place where God cannot be, where those who have rejected God are in silent isolation. As Jesus approaches this final task of redemption, we can perhaps understand why he used Psalm 31 for his last word from the cross. Quote, you are indeed my rock and my fortress. 
For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And Jesus reports on his work of salvation in hell when we hear these words in the book of Revelation. Quote, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, and see, I am alive forever and ever, and I have the keys of death and of hell. Our reading of the crucifixion story spoke about darkness covering the land, the darkness signifying death and hell. But it also tells us that the veil of the temple was torn in two, which was a symbolic act of cosmic importance. Remember that this was the veil which screened off the Holy of Holies, believed to be the place of God's presence in the temple of Jerusalem, entered only once a year by the high priest. God inaccessible, his nature and being a mystery. The work of salvation of Jesus on the cross changed all of that. For Jesus revealed the nature and character of God as the wounded healer who knows us and loves us and seeks us and redeems us and saves us. Through Jesus on the cross, God is revealed and God is accessible. That is the good news of the cross. The work of the cross is nothing less than a recreation of the order of the cosmos and of life within it because Christ is the consummation of creation and redemption. The cross inaugurates a new kingdom which subverts the powers and the systems of this cruel, unjust and violent world and establishes a new way of living which all are invited to share. That way of living is the royal road of the Holy Cross, which means following Christ in his life, his death, and his work. It is a royal road of sacrificial love and costly devotion, which if we join it, leads inevitably to misunderstanding and rejection and suffering. In other words, the royal road of the cross leads to our own cross, but it also leads to sharing with Christ in the victory and the glory of his cross. It is the journey of growing in holiness which we are invited to make, but each in our own way. So let Jesus, the crucified God, who is our God, provide the conclusion to these reflections in these words. Now is the judgment of this world. Now is the ruler of this world driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Amen.